Welcome to the Harnessing Happiness podcast. Upbeat vibes generated and transferred to you. Now here's your host, Sarah J. Naylor. Hello and welcome to Harnessing Happiness uh, with myself, Sarah J. Naylor. Thank you so much for taking the time to stop by and listen to this podcast episode. Today, I am delighted to be joined with Joined with? Joined by? Joined <laughs> joined with, I have with me, um, Eileen Jones. Now, I'm going to hand over to Eileen. As regular listeners will know, I always like my guests to introduce themselves because they do it far better than myself. So, over to you, Eileen. Please do take centre stage and introduce your fabulous self to my Thank listeners. you very much, Sarah, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm a journalist uh, with my own public relations business in the Lake District, um, and I'm the author of How Park Run Changed Our Lives, um, which came out last year. And I am an obsessive park runner and park run tourist. And that's really how we met only a few few short weeks ago, really. It was um, oh, power of social media and uh, one person making one comment and introducing me to Eileen via social media because I equally have um, a fabulous passion <laughs> For, for Park Run. And we have also have a, another passion now as well, don't we, Eileen, which is uh, Wordle. So if, if, I think if we start with all the Park Run stuff, because I mean, I've literally almost finished reading your book, but I had to pass it over to a friend of mine because I know he he would be really keen. And I know he's read it already. He's read it far quicker than I've read it. Um, but yes, I mean, what happened? How did you get really sort of so involved well, as I, you did? I've been a runner since done. my early 30s. And I used to run on the fells in the Lake District and in West Yorkshire, where I used to live. And I did really serious stuff. I've done fell races all over the lakes. I've run up and down Ben Nevis. I've done the Bens of Jura fell race and the Island of Jura. Wow. Wow. Um, but as the years went by and I became slower and slower, um, fell races weren't so much fun anymore because I was the one at the back, not really competing against anybody anymore and feeling embarrassed that the marshals were standing around on the summit checkpoints waiting for me or maybe one or two others to come through. And then on the longer events, when I got to the finish, you know, everybody mm-hmm. gone home, had their tea and there was one man sitting in a deck chair with a stopwatch kind of thing. I'd done a few trail races in the lakes, which were were Mm -hmm. good. And then my sister, who um, came to running much later in life, but lives in Manchester near one of the big park rooms at Heaton Park, she started going along to theirs. And when I was at her house one weekend, she took me along. And it was just a revelation that here was something that was, okay, it was free, which was great. It was regular. Um, Mm -hmm. It was a manageable distance, even if you were tired, hungover, (laughs) semi-injured. But I was part of something again. I was actually in amongst people. Mm -hmm. And I know it's not a race, but there's always somebody you can try and catch or or try and get in front of. Mm -hmm. So I loved it. And I did um, heat and whenever I was over at her house. Meanwhile, my sons were both in London at the time. And so when I went to stay with them, I'd find London park runs to do. Um, Firstly, at Gunnersbury in West London and then Mm -hmm. at Tooting Common, where I happened upon um, a woman called Louise Ayling, who was doing her 250th that day. And she was wearing this yellow and black buff around her neck. And I said, oh, what club is that? And she Mm -hmm. said, no, it's not. A running club it's the cat it's the cowl the cow cow we are park run tourists and i'd never heard of this so i put it up and realized yeah. i've done 13 different ones and thought oh if i get to 20 <laughs> so i carried on doing different park runs but in the meantime up in the lake district i got together with some other people and we set up one at fell foot at the bottom of windermere it's a national trust park that Beautiful. sounds wonderful it's a lovely lovely place we set that up mm-hmm. in 2014 Mm-hmm. And I also helped set up a local one to, to where I live in Ambleside in just, it started actually just before um, the pandemic lockdown. Its, its first one was in January 2020. And I mm-hmm. helped get a team together to run that. So I've got some experience of being involved on the organizing side. And also um, I've traveled around the country and a little bit further. You know, I've been to Italy to do a part run. Oh, really? Oh, Man. Wow. And 
And I Yay. went to Jersey to get my J and I went to Guernsey to get my G and so on. So have you got your Bee Gees then? <laughs> I've got the Staying Alive Challenge, yeah. Guernsey was, was the yes. last thing I needed for the Staying Alive Challenge, yeah. That's something I guess we ought to sort of discuss. I mean, that that, that is, I think, uh, something, well, you introduced <laughs> me to, because obviously we'd met via social media and then yeah. um, you told me you were at the running show. And so I came along with my partner and we came to your stand and we were chatting and you introduced me to the... Um, 5k yes, app yeah. isn't it that's what it's called yes the 5k app which I've downloaded and it's fascinating because you know even hearing how your journey has been with sort of the part run and you've obviously been involved in it for a lot longer than I have I mean I only how was it three three years I don't know we've yeah. lost a year with with, <laughs> with lockdown it kind of just sort of like what happened because I was on my I did my 49th the week before we went into lockdown yeah. so I had to wait 18 right, months yeah. it was yeah. or something like that yeah. wasn't it to get my 50th and I've now done 70 part runs so I'm sort of quite a newbie yeah. in many respects even though there's people starting yeah. it all the time but but I didn't know about part run tourism till only recently I didn't know so all the things that you <laughs> yeah. didn't know about, but you've yeah. known about, <laughs> I'm yeah. on that journey of discovery. But there are all these things on that app that you can actually do. So like you were alluding to before, the park run itself, you can use it as a race, can't you? You yeah. can use it as to, to challenge yourself. And, you know, but I'm I'm probably one of those people at the back, yeah. Eileen. That's yeah. the, I'm usually fitting, that's, finishing that's, in the that's bottom fine. quarter. That, that's why the, the park run challenges, like doing different tourist ones. I've now done 117 different ones. Um, doing your milestones, I'm up to 286 part runs, I think. But also the daft ones, like the BG Staying Alive Challenge, three Bs and three Gs, the Pirates Challenge, seven Cs. I like that. <laughs> it's seven Cs and R. I went to do my, I'd got, oh no, I'd done Richmond. And when I was doing my seventh C, which was at Conway, a friend sent me a text message mm -hmm. saying, D-F-Y-E, don't forget your eye patch. And, and you know, <laughs> those sorts of things just are so worthwhile. When you know you're not going to run any faster and you know that you're not going to get a person's yes. best, those little things are just wonderful. And the one that I'm most proud of, um, the name challenge, mm -hmm. was actually my invention because... As well as the oh, as well as the five k right. app on the phone, there is um, a running challenges uh, Chrome extension that you can use on on desktops, which got a lot more yeah. detail. And they, the people who run mm. that are ju they're just doing it for the fun of it. It's all you know using park run stats, but it's separate from. Oh, because when I've been reading your book, I, I I saw that, and I wasn't sure. I got a little bit confused as to whether that was to do with the the five k or so. It's separate, is it? They're separate. They came first. And um, I've been following on Twitter a travel writer called Lottie, who, when she was bored mm -hmm. one day, was going through the letters in her name and seeing if they were the initials of cities that she'd visited. So, you know, Lisbon, Oslo, and so on. Mm -hmm. So I just jokingly tweeted back, and I was using the Felfoot part run Twitter account at the time, and said, Hey, uh, mm -hmm. running challenges! Wouldn't this be fun for for park run? And within and within minutes, uh -huh. it was up there. You know, they'd take me on board, and it became an official challenge. The problem is, I've got too many wow. E's in my name. Yeah. I've probably <laughs> done your name all the way through, but I'm still looking for two more E's. Oh, there. are you? Oh, so right. I've, I've so done Edmonton, is... Inverness, Lytham, Edinburgh. But then we've got another E missing, and then Northampton, Jersey, Osterley, Nobles, another E missing, Sewer Beach, and so on. Oh, really of course. Well, I've got three A's oh, in I've mine. Done, so I've done Abingdon, mm. Alexand Ali Pali, and Alexandra Park. So I've just. <laughs> oh, what, what's, what begins with. Are there any that begin with Y? York. Oh, of course. I think maybe Yeovil, but I don't know. But um, ah. it, York at the moment, it was yesterday there were swans swimming on the race course. So, oh, like, really? Oh, gosh. Weekend. We're thinking about doing Beaver um, again oh, nice. tomorrow. Yeah. And for anybody that's actually listening, um, Beaver is um, spelt B E 
B-E-L-V-O-I-R. So Belvoir. And it's it's stunning. It's such a, it's a, looks, I always like it when I'm driving up to it because it's high on the hill and you're going across all this flat land and it actually looks like the Disney yeah, castle yeah. as you're driving <laughs> to it. it. It's amazing. Yeah. And I did the inaugural um, Beaver Park Run because it's only about sort of half an hour, 35 minutes from where I live. And it was a beautiful, it was a minus two. So it was really cold. It was really crispy. It was really icy. It, and the, the sun was coming up. It was burning through the sky. And it was just stunning. And you run down for a mile. <laughs> and that's fine. And then you're running up for half a mile. Yeah. Down, back, do a hairpin, back down for half a mile. And then you're doing a mile up on the way back and it was like oh my gosh I really wanted to take photographs but actually if I'd have stopped I wouldn't have been going again to. but that's the beauty yeah, isn't absolutely. it of being a tourist yeah. you go to all these amazing places yeah. and uh, yeah. see different locations and, and also meet, the beauty meet different people because you know, the people are the the things that make part run what it is you know there's I was just listening again last night to um the lecture that Paul Sinton Hewitt gave when he was awarded the medal by the Royal Society of Arts. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was all about, you know, he started something, but it's the people who carried it on that make it what it is. And he says, um, at the heart of it, he firmly believes that people are good. And to go out mm -hmm. and just find all these wonderful people doing wonderful things, especially when the world's in such a mess and it's such a miserable place, you exactly and you can shut you, off from all of that and concentrate on what you can do within your own environment and your mm -hmm. own life to make the place the world a little bit happier your own world a little bit happier when um, we were launching the book last year i think this was the a, a fantastic example of people coming together we couldn't launch the book in a bookshop because we were in the middle of lockdown. All the bookshops were closed. The book came out at the beginning of March. So um, I'd originally hoped that we would launch it at Bushy, where everything started. Mm -hmm. So I still thought, well, let's try and get the book to Bushy Park. And how do we get there? Well, we're runners. We'll run there. And somehow mm -hmm. I managed to organize during lockdown a relay that took seven days over 330 miles Wow. From Fellfoot at Windermere to Bushy Park. And I recruited 105 people, most of whom I had never met. Some of them I still haven't met. Oh, and somehow wow. or other, they all came on board because they wanted to be part of something bigger than themselves. Mm. And just organizing it was, was utter joy because... People wanted to be part of it. We had to be very careful. We were under restrictions. People could only exercise yes. near where they lived. So once mm -hmm. we found a pedestrian route, we could only um, use the runners who lived near to that route. So there were people volunteering from Yorkshire and so on, and even from the east side of Manchester. And we said, no, no, because you, you can't travel of course. that far. Of course. We had to run, uh, people could run in pairs, but no more than that. You could only run two at a time. But it, it worked amazingly well. Um, a friend who has a business that he does tracking for big races and big events, he loaned us a mm. couple of trackers. So people oh, were able wow. to follow the dots all through the week. Um, oh, really? Oh, wow. Overnight, wherever the book rested. One night, um, I think it was in, in the Midlands. But the, on the last day, I was able to drive. I was officially allowed to drive to London to see it arrive because I was working to promote the book. Of course. And I went to Bushy and I'd arranged to meet Paul Sinton Hewitt and his wife, Jo. And the plan was mm -hmm. to hand the copy of the book to them. And I think that was possibly one of the happiest days of my life. Because oh, it was the wow. coming together of mm. efforts by all these people who had just done this out of the goodness of their hearts to make themselves mm -hmm. happy. And we were waiting in the park um, Paul had his phone out and was watching the tracker and said, I think they're coming. I think they're near the gates. Oh. The last two runners, Sophie and Chris, came up the very, very long drive towards the Diana Fountain. And I could see these mm -hmm. two figures in red getting closer. And they came up and they took, we had a customized rucksack that the book had been. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah, it was lovely. Um, oh, brilliant. So they took the rucksack off and they put it down on the ground for Paul to pick up. And Paul said, that's the exact spot where the first park run started. He'd stood there, he'd oh. stood there on purpose. And it was oh, just, wow. You know, oh, I, 
Oh, oh you're making me go all tingly. People have made this happen. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, Paul's got a very good sense of humour, I learned. Um, <laughs> I was standing to, there wasn't a big crowd. You know, we weren't allowed to publicise the finish very much. There was a couple of friends of mine who come to watch, a photographer, mm -hmm. one or two people from the local running club. And Paul just looked around and said, oh, there's 13 people here. That's the number of people who ran the first park run at Bushy. Oh, my god! I was standing to one side and he opened the rucksack and held this package. And I'd wrapped it in loads and loads of waterproof paper. Yes. And he held yeah, it yeah. up and I said, do you want a pen knife? No, no, I'd like past the parcel. So he starts taking all this packaging off. And he opened the last bit of packaging and he just turned to me and he said, Eileen, you've put the wrong book in. <laughs> and for a split second, I, and then I went, oh, you bugger. <laughs> and then he held the book off, you know, for the... <laughs> and I honestly think oh. that organising that was as great an achievement, if not greater, than the writing of the book. Writing is my craft. It's what I do all yes, every day. Yes, of course. And all I did was listen to people's wonderful, wonderful stories and write them down, you know. So that wasn't really hard. Um, but the achievement of getting that book where, where, the way we did it was just... Oh, it's phenomenal. I mean, it's just a great. I mean, reading the book, though, myself, you must have done so much research, though. I mean, yeah. so much information and factual information and sort of stories and, you say, anecdotes and yeah. things like that. To me, I mean, that... In itself, I mean, it, you, I mean, you, it started, didn't you? Did you, you started in lockdown, well, that, didn't you? Was it, had you started it just before? No, the whole point was that I'd been nagged at by various friends over the years. Every time I came back to Felfoot with stories from my travels, oh, you should write it down, you should write a book. And I said, I've not got time. And suddenly, mm -hmm. you know, when lockdown hit, I had time. And I was very, very depressed at first. You know, people are my mm -hmm. oxygen and I was starved of oxygen yes. and it was really hard. Um, mm -hmm. And I whinged and moaned, you know, everywhere until I woke up one morning. It was, I know I know, it was the 2nd of August, uh, very early in the morning. And I was just thinking about parkrun and how it's like a religion. Mm -hmm. And I was brought up as a Catholic. And so I started to okay. think of these analogies like we commune together, we congregate mm -hmm. together, we share a litany and a liturgy, mm -hmm. which is the same wherever you go and it's familiar and we celebrate each other's lives and we come away feeling good about ourselves. That's church on a Sunday morning, but it's part one on a Saturday morning. Yes. So I got up really early, switched the computer on, and within an hour I had 2,000 words written. And I just thought, wow. here it goes, this is going to be a book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But then yes. I did have the time still because all my work had dried up. You know, mm -hmm. you know, I work for mostly tourism and hospitality organisations in the lakes, so they were all mm -hmm. shut. Um, yes, everything just stopped, stopped. didn't it? So, um, <laughs> I had time to do the research, and I was very lucky. Um, mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful people who put me on to other people. Um, you know Colette Gregrave, who yes. in turn knows Rebecca Robinson, and Rebecca's a very good friend of mine, and she knows all those wonderful doctors in Sheffield who are part of the... Parkland Research Group, uh, ah, advisory okay. group. So I spoke mm -hmm. to Steve Hake there at length and his mm -hmm. colleagues, and they just gave me access to so much of their um, academic work that they'd done at that part room, which was wonderful. And then That's every, amazing. everybody I, I asked, you know, people to tell me their stories, they just were so happy to do it. You know, there were, it, was, it was something that they all wanted to be a part of. So this wonderful thing happened last Saturday, Sarah. I was mm. at Temple Newsome Park Room, because um, I'm still trying to do different ones all the time. Yeah. <laughs> my older son was with me, and it was really nice. I was glad he was there, because he actually saw this happen. And at the first time as briefing, and then they asked, you know, where's everybody from? So I had my hand mm -hmm. and I said, Felfoot. And a young woman in front of me spun round and said to her friend, oh, Felfoot, that's where the woman wrote the book. And then she looked at me and said, is it you? And I went, yeah, it is actually. And she uh, said, oh. oh. And she got really emotional and she said, oh, oh I love it so much. I've, I've read it loads of times. It's like my Bible. And she said to her friend, I can't believe it. You know, this is this is Alien who wrote the book and I so want to go. And the more she said, talked about it and the impact on her, we were both almost in tears. It was oh. so, and it was so spontaneous. It was so unprompted, you know. And, um, yes, yeah. 
Synchronicity yeah, at work, absolutely. I believe. Which is one of my favourite yeah. words. Yeah, I like synchronicity. Have you read Synchro Destiny by mm-hmm. Deepak Chopra? Oh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> There's one to add to, your, <laughs> add to your yeah. list. But I mean, the thing is, you were saying about people sharing their stories with Park Run and wanting to be open, but that's the passion everybody has for it. And mm-hmm. the, the beauty of it is that it is free. People can walk it, they can run it. I mean, we would there's obviously a discussion at the moment about whether dogs will continue that's another sort of issue but you know children can go and there's a there's the children's version of the park yeah. run and the community and also we haven't touched on the power of the volunteers oh, gosh, yeah. without the volunteers oh, yeah. it doesn't happen I mean I've yeah. only volunteered myself twice but I recorded a podcast about that uh, in itself because just turning up and being part oh, yeah. of that volunteer yeah. community yeah. Is, is is actually gives you so much more even than actually taking yeah, part in the yeah, part run because yeah. you know if you're clapping go yeah yeah come on whoa as you people are going past you're you're sending that information down to your own subconscious oh, yeah. you are you know yeah. you're, you're filling yourself full up with these really feel good vibes as you're giving those feel good vibes to other people and you're, and it, you're enabling you're... people to do something that's so good for them you know the... yeah exactly no, I love it. in fact um the first week we opened up um at the end of lockdown I did volunteer at Felfoot and I thought, well, I've written the whole chapter about how wonderful volunteering is, so I'd better, better go and do it. I have volunteered over a hundred times, actually. Um, yes. Because what I'm, I'm really good at getting up early in the morning and a lot of people aren't. So I often volunteer to do course set, pre, um, set up and I'm mm-hmm. also volunteer coordinator with three other girls at Felfoot. So that would be my role for the next two weeks. So, but I went down specifically... And I did as many volunteering jobs as I possibly could. You know, I set the course up and I said I was one of the marshals and then I was helping scan and everything else. Um, And this week, when I get back, I've been in York now, so living in York for four weeks and going to different park runs, which has been wonderful. Yay! I went back (laughs) to Felfoot and the first time back, I'll volunteer, definitely, um, just to put something back in. But you're actually getting something out. You know, people talk about putting in but it's just so rewarding to volunteer it is so oh absolutely well I, I mean I just found it magical so I've just done it I say have literally done it the twice and but what I'm trying to do now is perhaps do four runs and then the fifth yeah. one will be a yeah. volunteer one and sort of work it around yeah. that way but I'd had time off but oh just one thing and another and trust. anyway yeah I think it's just so powerful so so amazing and I, I hadn't mentioned I was going to mention as well that I mean I went on holiday um two or three years ago and I'd deliberately booked my accommodation in South Wales yeah. <laughs> so it was close to there are actually many there aren't many part runs in Wales which is quite surprising Haverford but I, Haverford West you went to do no I did <coughs> Colby Park oh. Colby Park run which is near Amroth in South oh, Wales wow. and it's a national trust um, run and you do three loops yeah. round um, the around the gardens around the oh, around gorgeous. the estate um, and the, in the B&B I was stopping and the guest house I was stopping in there were a couple who were from Mark Eaton Park Run, which is just yeah, in Derbyshire, yeah. just up the road from me. And um, they they book, they they go around the country, have weekends away based around where a park run is oh, going yeah. to be. So they, you <laughs> yeah. know, it's not just the park run tourism. They're going yeah, away for yeah. a weekend. That, that's the power of it, like you said, in the conversations. And that's something else that I wanted to bring up. You... Um, I saw you post on social media and I found it quite inspiring about talking to strangers oh, yeah. and yeah. the power of that, which obviously yeah. you, you can get so much of that from a park yeah. run. Yeah. And and it is, I mean, I, I don't know whether I actually commented on your post, but I always remember my mum saying, oh, you leave my gran at the d- yeah. bus stop and she'll have somebody's um, life history I, I love in, that. in five or ten I minutes. That. That, that's me. That is, that's what I do. <laughs> I just keep asking the questions until there is a connection, you know. And, and the the the, um, the thing that sparked that last week was a, a conversation at a bus stop here in York. When my bus didn't turn up, it had been cancelled, and I was talking to these two guys waiting there who were explaining why it, why it was cancelled. And you know, I don't know how we got onto the subject, but one of them was about to sing um, "This Is the Moment." He was going to play the lead in Jekyll and Hyde the musical, and yeah. had, had played the lead in Chess the musical. You know, two of my favourite musicals, and wow. he was just well away. Which brings me round to the next subject that a year ago almost, on the 1st of April, I said on Twitter that, okay, the book's published now, so watch out, world. I'm going to combine my two passions for the next project. Oh, Look out, yes. here comes Park Run, the musical. <laughs> Rebecca Robinson, who 
picked up on this, said, this isn't a joke, is it? You're going to do this. Of course it's a joke. Ridiculous. And we both said, <laughs> we're going to do it, which is why I've got to know the lovely Colette, who has oh, already recorded one of her, our songs. Oh, and really? Oh, wow. Written, we have a very, very short script. We need to do a lot of work on the script. We've got characters. We've got a storyline. And we have Colette, who is a minor red grave, of course. Um, of living, course. Living in a converted windmill in Portugal at the moment. Um, <laughs> is going to play our lead. So, oh, you know, brilliant. how much fun is that going to be? Oh, it's going to be awesome. So how long is the musical going to be then? Are you doing? Are you going to be putting it on at a theatre? Well, we hope so. Um, it's going to be mm-hmm. a one-act, fairly short, snappy. Um, with a very, very wonderful person called Eve Taylor, who is a partner ambassador in Cheshire and also on the... I think she's the event director at Macclesfield. And I'd met her once or twice on the touring circuit. And then when I was organising the relay, she was my right-hand woman. She just knows everybody in Portland and was able to help me recruit lots of people. And she's a mm-hmm. professional musician, so she's written and, and started playing to me on the piano some of her wonderful songs for this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, oh. if, 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 if it happens. But, yeah, we've, we've got an amateur theatre company possibly interested um, mm-hmm. And it would be great fun to stage it at places where there are, you know, in towns and cities where there are park runs. But we'll just wait. Yeah, so I was thinking of open air. I, just, I had it come yeah. into my head. Wouldn't it be great yeah. to do open yeah. open air yeah. theatre? And Oh, you could have it at the Minnock Theatre yeah. in Cornwall. That yeah. would be awesome with the sea as the backdrop and this amphitheatre. That would be just oh, amazing. Oh, still at Bushy Park, you know, at, at oh, 10 course. o'clock in the morning when most people have finished the run and then they can all come and watch. Oh, yes, Eileen, send that out. Let's manifest that. Oh, my gosh. It's a, yeah. And, and in fact, I tell you, I've, I've got, I have another idea. You know how you did your book and you promoted it? You could, it would be, it would be sort of delivered in one part run and then the, it would be that the, everybody would run to the next part run, part run and put yeah. it on there. So you've got this travelling, travelling production. Um, production. <laughs> But everybody's got to run it yeah. in between. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that sounds amazing. I mean, gosh, you're doing so much. And, you know, this is away from what, as you said, your your core work, which is in, in PR in the Lake District. And the Lake District, for anybody who doesn't know the UK, is in the middle of the UK. And it's where it's very wet and lots of beautiful lakes. And it's just it's stunning. Absolutely stunning. That's your core business, isn't it? Yeah, sort of yeah. I work, PR I work and- for... Um- few core businesses I do occasional short-term contracts as well but I work mostly for the Wordsworth family who own Rydal Mount where the poet William Wordsworth lived for most of his life which is a beautiful oh, house wow. which just happens to be about a mile from my house um, so I've worked for the Wordsworths for a number of years noting mm-hmm. what happens at the house and I work for a hotel, a really lovely hotel in the lakes called the Cedar Manor. If anybody wants to visit Windermere, it is the most wonderful hotel in, in the Lake District. Oh, wow. Um, I've done work over the years for um, an independent hostel at Elterwater. And I work occasionally and have done for many years for a beautiful um, art gallery and studio, the Heaton Cooper Studio in mm-hmm. Grasmere which is run by, well, it's a dynasty of, of, of artists, really, and it's the fourth generation, Becky Heaton Cooper, who is the manager of it now. Um, so I'm surrounded by beautiful things and wonderful people. So you can imagine my job Aren't is you? just well, fabulous, you know. It doesn't sound like a job at all. It sounds like just enjoying yeah. life, to be perfectly yeah. honest. It's mostly just and it, like that, honestly. Isn't it great when you, and I, this is something that I, I'm personally really passionate about, it's... Um, People, we've all got, we're all unique. We've all got our you know, unique talents and passions. It's when you align your career with what your, ta- yeah. your, your talents yeah. and your passions and it, you know, work is no longer work Absolutely. because you're doing something you're yeah. passionate about yeah. and you enjoy. And like you said, you know, you, you're in a beautiful location with amazing, you know, scenery and art and creativity. And then through all of this, then you've created the, you know, you've written the book and then you've, 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 you've manifested this sort of this journey and promoting it through the most difficult time yeah. of you know lockdown yeah. but you, it's about thinking outside of that yeah. box yeah. it's going being creative it's about yeah. pivoting it's it's about doing things differently and mm. even to what you're doing at the moment as you've said because uh, for those of you I've got a very very wide global audience I've been putting pins in a map this morning of where, <laughs> where my listeners are and it's awesome I'm so thank you for everybody who listens all over the world it's just awesome but the UK is it's cold and damp and 
I mean, I love the changing seasons, don't get yeah. me wrong, but January, February in the UK are tough, yeah. tough months. I mean, I'm not saying, yeah, crikey, first world problems, Eileen, yeah. eh? But, yeah. you know, it, it, it's... It, it sometimes can just get a bit sort of you've got short days and dark nights and it's wet and it's damp and it's cold and you just go oh give me some sunshine yeah. but you've actually broken that pattern this is what I wanted to allude to is that when you get into a position of whatever it is I mean we've just been alluding to the weather and the dark yeah. nights da, 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 da. but if you get into a sort of a, a pattern you think that you're feeling sort of fed up or something it's about breaking yeah. that state it's about doing something different to change those vibes and and that's what you've done hasn't it hasn't it that's what you've done yeah. during the month of February haven't you yeah yeah very much so to come and live somewhere different different and do the same work but from a different environment and a different setting and be open to different influences and different people and um, it has been wonderful. It was interesting, a couple of sentences back you used the word pivot. Um, mm. my, my motto in life is when in doubt, pivot. And yes. this came from my netball teacher at school. If you remember the um, game of netball where you're not yeah, yeah. to move when you've got the ball but you can spin around mm. on one foot. And she used to shout, when in doubt, girls, pivot. And I could, <laughs> and I've always thought, you know, if, you, if you're if stuck or you're down or you're not quite sure which way to go, just slowly turn, just pivot and see what the world looks like from the other angle. And then funnily enough, um, a couple of nights ago, I went to see this fantastic show, The Musical of Friends. And it's a satire, mm. it's a parody of the, of the TV. Oh, okay. It was brilliant. It was so full of energy. And mm. the cast were enjoying it so much and they were very, very talented. So that even if you didn't know the TV show, I mean, I got quite a few of the illusions. My, my daughter-in-law, who was with me, got virtually all of them. So she wastes her life far more than I do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've not really ever watched Friends, well, to be fair. It, so. was, it was just fabulous. They did really, really good Mickey takes of, of the main characters and the plots. Mm. But with in themselves they were but one of the songs was about pivoting you know and, and ah. choosing to turn around and, and have a think about things while you know it's giving yourself a moment to stop and think without plunging in recklessly as well I suppose at that Absolutely. I mean, I, I pivoted massively <laughs> when lockdown hit because I've got a recruitment business and it, it is predominant. I mean, I'm a coach as yeah. well and one thing or another, but, you know, I've got a big part of my life is my recruitment business and it just went, everything yeah. stopped. It's like, oh, so I pivoted and, I, and, and, and I've got so creative and I've done so many things and there's so much stuff has come out of it because of that. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm a real great believer in sort of accepting, I mean, I've, I've coined a phrase, ape ape mindset methodology methodology i should say and I, I sort of trademarked that myself last year because a is that that acceptance of what you can and you can't no, change yeah. and the p is perspective what you you know and look at like you were just talking about that pivoting and looking at things yeah. from a different angle because it's all there's always more than one way of yeah. looking at things yeah. there's, there's, there's masses of ways and then that energy you mentioned energy again it's where you then drive your energy yeah. there's no point in sitting there going oh yeah. well Let's accept that you can't change that. How can you look at it differently yeah. and then channel your energy in the right direction? And that makes, I, just, I think it's so simple. You've just got to execute it. But yeah. it's, at, at the end of the day, it's up to us. We are responsible for ourselves. Yeah. And it's what it's what we do to change our behaviour to get different results. Yeah. How do you harness happiness in your life, Eileen? <laughs> I don't know, really. I don't know about harnessing it. I suppose <laughs> I, I have got a fairly positive outlook. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also... I'm very up and down. I can, I have tendency to very, very extreme mood. So I have experienced mm -hmm. depression, which um, a mm -hmm. lot of outgoing, extrovert seeming people have, have done. Um, mm -hmm. And in many cases, you just have to wait and let it, um, let yourself come back out of it. Um, mm -hmm. Or really, you know, use the things that, if I'm, if I need to feel happier, I go up, I've got a, a hill a mount that small mountain where i live in Ambercy mm -hmm. called Lufrig. and yeah. it's impossible to go up to the summit of Lufrig and not feel happy you know once i'm up there and i get there's a summit cairn it's an, a, tr a triangulation post you know a big post okay post. yeah and, and mm -hmm. i literally hug it when i get there and it's just mm -hmm. the most fabulous view but even if there's no view even if it's throwing it down with rain so that's one of the things that i do running is always always mm. a great antidepressant um so that you know you set off from the house feeling a bit gloomy and within 200 meters it starts to fall away 
The other yes. thing I do, and it's this is also very, very clever, I have a tub of kids' bubbles by the back door. And if I'm feeling really sad, I'll open the door yeah. and I'll blow bubbles. And you cannot, oh, you yeah. cannot be miserable and blow bubbles at the same time. <laughs> you have to smile as you're doing it. And, and watching bubbles come out and float up in the back yes. garden... So people often say, oh, well, you've had the neighbour's kids in it. They left their bubbles behind. And, mm, no, it's not. No. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, I mean, what I've just really liked about the analogies and how you've just portrayed that is that you recognise when you, 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 you drop. And I think, you know... We've all got we, we've all got our, our emotion. We're emotional yeah, beings, aren't we? And you know, it's but it's it's that ability to recognise when you're down. But when you know that you can, as you said, you let it ride through and you can let it come out. But then you've got tools and techniques and things that you can do and that you've recognised that you can then put into place. And I think that's really key that you you have got an understanding and an ability to change your behaviour to bring about the sort of the return. Of a, of a higher vibrational frequency because I know when I, if I you know I feel very fortunate because I've got this sort of energy and I'm upbeat most of the time but when I do have this sort of a moment where it, everything sort of goes dump yeah. it's it's kind of like it goes dump and I go down straight away but I know that I just have to I I, I always say I allow myself to wallow in it and yeah. I just think yeah you know, I'm just going to allow yeah. myself and it's usually like a, like a 24 48 hour thing and it doesn't happen that often but I've recognized that as a trait and I, yeah, I don't worry about mm-hmm. it. I just allow it, as you said, to run its course. And then you've got the things that you do. I mean, I know I can, I recognise the energy coming back up and I know I'll give myself a kick up the backside and get things going yeah. again. Um, and like you've said, go out and run. You've That, that gets the adrenaline going and you, the feel good factor. I mean, I'm just looking outside as we're talking right now and the beauty of nature can't, but you know, it's just like, oh my gosh, and getting excited. And you're going up to that mountain. It's like, yeah, you've got that place you can go yeah. to. So it's having those things that you can turn to that then, you know, you've previously anchored that reignite that good yeah. feeling because it brings it all back. And there are things that you can do with NLP that you can just do that in a sort of an instant yeah. that you you know, right, I'm going to go and press that bit on the wall and it will remind me of that song that I want to sing and yes. go, yay! Yes, yeah, yeah. so I think, yeah, music also is very important in that respect. You mm. suddenly hear a piece of music you've not heard for a long time and it can have an instant uplift. I think um, I mentioned before about one of the happiest days of my life being at the end mm. of the relay. I think the happiest moment of my entire life was when my youngest son, he'd been at um, Musical Theatre College in London. He was at Arts Ed and he was coming to the end of his final year and was auditioning. And he called me one night, he rang me and he said, Mum, do you want the good news or the bad news? And I said, oh, give me the bad news first. And he said, (laughs) I didn't get Shrek. I didn't get the tour of Shrek. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry, darling. What's the good news? I've got Les Mis. Oh, yeah. wow. Oh, moment, my gosh. And this was all his life. My, both my boys got into amateur musical theatre very young, not through me, through here, you know, the guys they met. And they were on stage from a very young age. And from the age of six, David didn't just want to be on the West End stage. He wanted to be on the West End stage in Les Mis. And so, oh, you know, wow. he got this part and he played it for a year. He was on stage as swing in the show for a year in the West End. And that oh, moment, um, this surge of happiness for somebody yeah. else, but it's reflected, yes. you know, I, lit- I physically felt it for him. Um, there were other moments. I just remember once walking down a mountain in the lakes. It was steel fell and it was quite a gloomy day and... Um, mm. The boy's dad, he'd run on ahead to get the to bring the car because it was raining so much. And they were both holding my hand. They were probably about 9 and 11 or something at that stage. And I just thought at that moment, I don't think I could possibly be happier oh, than I am now. That's so so never lovely. to do with possessions or, no. you know, material achievement. It, it's that sensation. I can, have I got time to tell you a wonderful story that will make you happy? Yes, in fact, I think we should finish on that okay. wonderful story. And you've actually, just as a side before you go on to that, you've triggered a memory of mine with when I was with my son running through a field of waist-high buttercups. Oh. And he was about three or yeah. four. And it was just 
stunning and it is it's all about its emotions and uh, you know energy and vibes it's not about your biggest bank account it's not it really isn't it isn't but yeah david the the my son who went he played in lay miss for 12 months and at the end mm. of it um you know he'd been on stage for there were eight shows a week and um he was worn out so he went off traveling and he went to south america and mm-hmm. being a boy, he didn't get in touch with his mum very often. You know, the occasional yeah. text message once every couple of weeks. And one day he called me. He actually rang me from Peru. Oh, and wow. he said, mum, guess what? And he'd had a phone call from his friend, Lewis, who mm. um, they'd shared a room together when they were studying at, at Artshead. And Lewis was touring in the musical Sister Act. And oh, was um, in Wales and had broken down in his car in Swansea. And the local garage came out to rescue him. And he said they were really nice. And they said, oh, we'll get you back on the road. Don't you worry. And this young man said to him, what are you doing in these parts? And Louis said, oh, well, I'm in a show. And he said, oh, what part are you playing? And he said, well, I'm not um, one particular part. I'm what's called swing. And before he could mm. explain any further, the garage mechanic said, Oh, that's really difficult, isn't it? Because you never know from one night to the next what you're going on as. And you've got to learn everybody else's part so that you can just slot in. And Louis said, how do you know what a swing does in a musical? And the garage mechanic said, last year, my mum and dad went to London to see Les Mis. And they sat next to a woman in the audience whose son was the swing in the show. No! Oh, my God! (laughs) (laughs) And I think that is the best small world story ever. Whoa. Oh, you've made me go all tingly again. He he was telling me this from Peru. And he'd been called from Wales. to. And it was, I just thought the world is a small place full of lovely people. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And I just love stories of synchronicity and how things sort of click together. And I love, I love seeing how it, how that happens and how, you know, the part you play. I mean, and I have to say just as a a quick side note is that, you know, in, in, in my, in my world in recruitment, I've always been really mindful of that part that I play in people's lives and how I could, you know, you've got, you know, it's not about forcing people into jobs for money. That's why I've never been the the most wealthiest (laughs) of recruiters, but I'm about listening and taking care and making sure people go into the right place in the right slots but yeah and it's it is and that whole synchronicity of stuff and the conversations that when we started to talk about meeting strangers well, and things right. like that you and see I, I had been i remembered being in the theater because I, I saw the show yeah. 11 times while he was in the <laughs> <laughs> hashtag proud yeah. mum <laughs> and if i was in the theater on my own i would t- in the interval i'd t- turn to the people next to me and i said that's my boy that's my boy and I do remember this couple because they had another son. They said to me, oh, we've got a famous son and he plays midfield for Swansea City. I can't remember his name now, but my older son who's into football knew the moment I came out of the theatre and I met yeah, him. Yeah. So I remembered the conversation with them. So that's why you must talk to strangers. You absolutely must. Absolutely. And it is, it's finding that point it's of rapport well. and that's what I... Yeah, I used to do in recruitment. I would always try and work, find something, yeah. find that connection. Yeah. So you yeah. you build that trust in a natural, nice yeah. way, not in a sort of narcissistic yeah. way or anything like that. But it's about that sort of bringing the best out of people. And I, you know, it's it's a natural. I was doing it naturally. When I actually trained as a coach, I discovered it was it's called rapport building. <laughs> it's like, oh, I didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> But it is the beauty of that and finding that connection, having that conversation with somebody and it can, it unravels all sorts of incredible conversations yeah. and connections and things that can, like you say, take you to a conversa- a phone call from Peru from somebody that, your son that normally texts you once in a blue moon and go, hey mum, guess what? That's <laughs> brilliant. Oh, Eileen, thank you so much for your, your time and oh, sharing oh all your stories about pop run and musicals and, you know, and of everything and yeah, the, your, you know part of your life etc so how do people get in touch with you if they want to get in touch with you for your book your musical your your pr in the lake district how, how do they find okay, well, you well I'm, I'm on twitter as um cumbria pr all one word um so that and i'm i'm there a lot because I, I work I, I, I use social media a lot for work so cumbria pr um they find me there if they want to know more about the book and about the relay and also the way that a copy of the book is, is wandering around the country on its own at the moment being... Oh, right. <laughs> um, go to the uh, website of Gritstone Publishing. Um, they are the people who publish my book. So Gritstone Publishing, 
um, have got a blog where I, the story of the relay is written, but also you can buy the book online through Gritstone. You can get it on Amazon as well, but if you buy it through Gritstone, you'll get a signed copy. Thank you so much, Eileen, and thank you everyone for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode with myself and Eileen. Um, I certainly have. It's been marvellous. Um, I just love talking to my guests. And I, oh, <laughs> it's great to have a chance to speak to Eileen again. Um, so yeah, if you've enjoyed it, please do rate, review, uh, follow, subscribe, whatever you do on your platform. Thank you, Eileen, once more. And this is me, me, Sarah, Jane Hayler at Harnessing Happiness saying goodbye. And until next time, take care and look after yourselves. Thanks for listening to the Harnessing Happiness podcast with Sarah Jane Naylor. If you took value from the content, please follow the show on your podcast app. And to find out more about Sarah's ape mindset, visit sarahjnaylor.com. That's